So uh, let's do a little bit of a review. In the, in the first lesson of the series, uh, we learned about how good and evil became inextricably mixed up one with the other, a real mishmash, and therefore choosing good and rejecting evil was uh, established as a struggle that every human being has to face. In the second lesson, we learned that God empowered mankind to influence the world and its outcomes for good or for bad. In the third lesson last week, we encountered the powerful forces of tohu, chaos, and tikkun, repair, and the symbiotic relationship between the two. Tohu, just by way of reminder, is when the divine energy is greater than the container through which it's expressed. And tikkun is where the, where the divine energy is less intense and the container is more is larger and leads, lead, leading to a much more stable combination. So we learned that Asav was the physical embodiment of tohu, expressed in his wild and unrestrained nature. Uh, and Yaakov was the physical embodiment of tikkun, calm, studious, and contained. And you remember that Isaac idealistically believed that the two forces could coexist peacefully in the universe, and he was quite ready to give each one of his sons the blessing that was appropriate to their specific nature. And Rivka prophetically understood that Tohu, if it's not controlled or moderated and directed by the forces of Tikkun, could become a dangerously destructive force, just spin out of control. So she engineered by deception, that Yaakov would receive both the blessings of Tohu and of Tikkun from Isaac, and in that way she neutered the raw force of undirected Tohu. And then at the end of last week's lesson, I remarked that deception, even if it's for a good cause, will have its consequences. And so this week we will study the consequences and the complicated tangle of relationships that it brought in its weight, in its wake, and with long-term historical consequences that, are going to imp that impact on our lives to this very day. And that's our agenda for tonight. And as always, we'll start with, the, with a piece of text. Uh, in this instance, they are texts 1a and b on, in your workbooks on page 102, which are going to be read out with that awful music, but that lovely voice on the video that I'm going to that I'm going to show you. It is the well-known story of the jealousy between Joseph and his brothers. So if Rabbi Eli has allowed me to share sc screen, I shall do just that. Once again, a thumbs up, please, when you can indicate to me that you can see and hear. Joseph was 17 years old, shepherding with his brothers in the flocks. And Joseph brought bad word of them to their father. Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons, as he was a child of old age to him, and he made him a striped coat. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and they hated him. And they were not able to speak peaceably with him. Joseph dreamed a dream and told his brothers, Here we were bundling sheaves in the middle of the field, and here my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and here your sheaves surrounded, and they bowed to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Shall you then reign over us, or will you rule over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. He again dreamed another dream and related it to his brothers, and he said, Here I have dreamed another dream, and behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing to me. His brothers envied him, but his father guarded the matter. Things come to a head when, one day, Jacob sends Joseph to check on his brothers, who are out shepherding the flocks in the countryside. saw him from afar, and when he had yet to come near to them, they schemed against him to put him to death. And they said to one another, Here comes the dreamer. Now let us go and kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we will say, 
An evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Reuben, the eldest of the brothers, dissuades the others from committing outright murder, suggesting that, instead, they throw him into one of the pits out there in the wilderness. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his coat, the striped coat that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. They sat down to eat bread, and they lifted their eyes, and they saw, Behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. But our hand shall not be upon him, as he is our brother, our flesh. His brothers listened, and they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph to Egypt. They took Joseph's coat, and they slaughtered a hairy goat, and they dipped the coat in the blood. They sent the striped coat to their father, and they said, We found this. Please recognize. Is it your son's coat or not? He recognized it and said, My son's coat. An evil beast has devoured him. Torn. Joseph is torn. And he mourned his son many days. Okay, so in summary, uh, Jacob shows a preference for Joseph over all the other children. Joseph in turn speaks negatively about his brothers to his father and arouses their jealousy by telling him of their dreams, which predict that he will rule over them. The brothers plot to kill Joseph and then end up selling him into slavery while misleading their father into believing that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Let's move on to part two of the story that took place now 22 years later, the reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers. Once again, I will do a share screen. Just as soon as I find it. The next segment we will read is from Genesis chapter 45, and it occurs 22 years after the selling of Joseph. In the interim, this is what happened. Joseph was taken to Egypt and sold to Potiphar, a high-ranking officer in Pharaoh's court. Joseph was immensely successful in everything that he did, and he was put in charge of all his master's affairs. Potiphar's wife lusted after the beautiful and charismatic young slave and she tried to seduce him. When Joseph rejected her advances, Potiphar's wife had him thrown into prison. After many years in prison, Joseph gained his freedom when he successfully interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, which predicted seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. Pharaoh appointed Joseph viceroy of Egypt, and Joseph's successful planning saved the entire region from starvation. The famine also engulfed the land of Israel, and Joseph's brothers came to Egypt to purchase grain. Joseph recognized them, but they did not recognize him. Joseph accused his brothers of being spies. Taking one of the brothers as a hostage, he forced them to bring their youngest brother, Benjamin, to Egypt. At first, Jacob refused to send Benjamin to Egypt, but the famine was in full force and soon their food ran out. Finally, Judah persuaded Jacob by vowing to assume personal responsibility for Benjamin's safety. When the brothers came to Egypt for the second time, Joseph framed Benjamin by planting his silver goblet in Benjamin's sack. 
he arrested the brothers and declared that Benjamin will remain in Egypt as his slave. Judah approaches Joseph to plead for Benjamin's release, offering himself as a slave in Benjamin's place. This is what happens next. Joseph was no longer able to constrain himself, and he called, Remove every man from my presence. And no man stood with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He put his voice to weeping, and Egypt heard, and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? His brothers could not answer him, because they were bewildered before him. And Joseph said to his brothers, And now do not be distressed, and it should not upset you that you sold me here. For as a source of livelihood, God has sent me before you. It is not you who sent me here, but God. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, So said your son Joseph, God has placed me master to all of Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. And that is how Jacob and his 12 sons, who would become the 12 tribes of Israel, ended up in Egypt. So wait, let's just get rid of this. Okay. So there are two glaring questions that arise from these passages. The first from the first piece of video that we saw was how could the brothers do such a thing? To plot to kill their own brother, to sell their own brother into slavery. Yes, granted there was jealousy, but their response seems to be, even in a jealous family, a little bit extreme. Joseph's, Joseph's um, Second question is Joseph's bizarre and inconsistent behavior when the brothers come down to Egypt. At first glance, Joseph seems to be tormenting his brothers in revenge for what they did to him. He accuses them of being spies. He releases them but keeps one of them a hostage. He forces them to bring Benjamin down to Egypt. He frames Benjamin and threatens to keep him as his slave. And yet, in that piece that we've just heard, when his brothers are overcome with shame, he says to them, do not be distressed, and it shouldn't upset you that you sold me here, for as a source of livelihood, God has sent me before you. And in those words, there's no trace of anger or ill will. He assures them that he, he doesn't wear, bear a, a grudge against them. So there's an inconsistency between what he did and what he eventually said. And unless he underwent a kind of like a 180 degree change in his feelings towards his, towards his brothers, we don't understand the story. Did we, did we miss something in this passage? Those are the, the questions for tonight. And we're going to begin with the first question, the brother's behavior towards Joseph. Of course, we have already encountered, even in these few short chapters that bring us to this point over here, uh, feuding brothers. Cain, after all, kills his brother Hevel. Asaph has plotted to kill jo Yaakov, Jacob. But, but these, it needs, we need to understand, these are classic good brother, evil brother models. And this time, in relation to Joseph and his brothers, you can't frame it in that same kind of paradigm. Please take a look at your text on page 107, text number three. And once again, perhaps somebody who hasn't read before will um, be bold enough to take this up and just to read this piece of text. Okay, I'll do it. Please go for it. Okay. Um, before explaining how the story of the selling of Joseph and all that happened with him is the basis for the kingdom of David and Messiah, we must address the great difficulties with this story. First of all, a most general difficulty, the greatness of the sons of Jacob, the progenitors of the 12 tribes of, the, of Israel is well known. Certainly, they were greater than the super, supernal angels. 
as I represent the mystical 12 configurations of the divine name Havaya. How then could the mind grasp the idea that these exalted individuals would join together to commit the most severe sin of all the sins in the world, namely the sin of murder? Yes, well, the author of this, author of this piece is the Shnei Luchot of Brit, a great Kabbalist, so he makes his mention about the 12 configurations. It's not our business for tonight. What we need to take from this piece of text over here is that he couches the brothers of Joseph as very great and holy, holy men. Uh, and so that therefore reinforces our question. How could these brothers who are so righteous, such holy men, do such a thing against Joseph? Well, and there are um, a number of explanations which are given by the commentators. Uh, and we're going, to, we're going to look at three of them um, before we dig a little bit more deeply. Uh, the first explanation, um, which you will see in uh, your workbooks on page 108, text four, is taken from the Talmud itself. Uh, somebody please to read it. Again, if somebody who hasn't read previously, don't be shy. Just um, a person should never discriminate between his children. Look what happened on account of the two sellers' weights of fine spun wool that Jacob bestowed upon Joseph more than his other children, provoking their jealousy and causing our forefathers to end up in Egypt. So um, this explanation for the behavior is uh, that both Joseph and Jacob are to blame. Jacob is to blame for showing favoritism to Joseph. Joseph is to blame for reveling in his position as a favorite son. He bad mouths his brothers for his, for his father. He repeatedly recounts the, his dreams that predict that he's gonna rule over them. So what do you expect for goodness sake if people behave like that? That's our first explanation. Our second explanation is in two parts, one from the Sforna, another from the Kedat Yitzchak. It's your text number five on page 109, followed by text number six on page 110. So if two separate people would please read text number five and somebody else read text number six, so that we can see what our second explanation is. Don't be shy. Anyway. Okay, Barry. Right. They saw Joseph as one who was plotting to destroy them, physically or spiritually, or both together. And the Torah states, one who is coming to kill you, make haste to kill him first. Okay, well, this will be elaborated upon in text number six. How about I read that? Okay, excellent, Simon. Thank you. When they saw that, of all his children, Jacob loved only Joseph, they thought that what will happen to them will be the same as what happened to Ishmael and the children of Keturah vis-a-vis -vis Isaac and to Esau vis-a-vis -vis Jacob. They believed that for as long as Joseph was alive, they would have no portion in the God of Israel and their descendants would be excluded from the blessing given to Abraham and Isaac. To be a god to you and to your descendants after you. This belief was confirmed to them by the fact that they saw that until now only one of the children of each of the patriarchs merited this blessing. So we have the self-defense as the argument over here as opposed to uh, you uh, they, they brought it upon themselves. Let's just understand these two explanations from this foreigner and Akedat Yitzchak. And we need to go back just a little bit. Abraham is the first Jew. He enters into a covenant with God. God promises Abraham that his descendants will become God's treasured people. He is given the Holy Land as an eternal inheritance, and he will serve as a blessing for all mankind. But among Abraham's children, only Yitzchak was chosen to carry on the legacy of Abraham. The others, Yishmael, who is Abraham's oldest son, and the six sons of Abraham's third wife, Keturah, that he has after the age of 175, Canaan horror, they were left out completely. Okay? 
<clears throat> Same thing happens in the next generation with Yitzhak's two children, Yaakov, Jacob, and Esau. Jacob was given the blessings of Abraham. Esau was excluded from the covenant. So when the brothers now see Jacob's preferential treatment of Joseph, and they see Joseph bringing negative reports to their father, they fear that this process of elimination is going to happen in this third generation as well, and is going to apply to all of them as, Jacob, as Jacob's children. Joseph is going to be chosen to be part of the special covenant of God. They will be excluded just like Ishmael and just like Asaph in the previous two generations. We can understand from their perspective the nature of the problem. For the brothers to be excluded in this way from the inheritance, the, the legacy of Abraham, was for them a fate worse than death. And although Joseph has not threatened them, their lives in the physical sense, they viewed him as a threat to their spiritual existence. And this justified them, according to these commentaries, taking these extreme measures. A third explanation for the behavior from the Shnei Luchot Abrit, the Shelah, the of this great Kabbalist again, and it is the sovereignty issue. It's in your text number seven on page 111. And a reader, please. The crown of sovereignty is Alan. Thank the you. The crown of sovereignty was granted to Dura. However, were it not to have been preceded by the kingdom of Joseph in Egypt, the kingdom of Judah would never have materialized as the people of Israel would not have become a nation, God forbid. For Joseph is the channel. Joseph's brother failed to understand this. Rather, they thought that Joseph was seeking the sovereignty permanently and exclusively for himself and his descendants. They therefore judged him by the law of the Torah, concluding that he is deserving of death as one who's contesting the sovereignty of the house of David. For one who contests the sovereignty of the house of David as if he contested the divine presence. Well, there's a big subject matter over here, which we will come back to a little bit later on. But um, the summary of it is as follows. As foretold in Jacob's blessings to his children before he dies, when he gathers them all around their bed, his bed, he says, starting from King David, all of the kings and the leaders of Israel, as well as the future ultimate leader, the Mashiach, are going to be destined to derive from the tribe of Judah. His words are, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the law give a staff from between his feet. So when Joseph began sharing his dreams that indicated that he would reign over his brothers and assume the leadership of Israel, they judged him to be somebody who was a usurper of the sovereignty, which was a crime of high treason, punishable by death. Those are three explanations. The one is that they brought it upon themselves. The, the second is that it was a matter of, um, of self-defense. Uh, and the third was for their own preservation to be included in the, uh, in the legacy of, of Abraham. Uh, and the third was that uh, this question of sovereignty. Um, all of these explanations are per perfectly plausible worthy of discussion if we wanted to spend the rest of the night talking about them. They, of course, shed some light on the brothers' deeper motives, but they don't tell the whole story. So it's time for us now to dig deeper and to get down to the very roots of this conflict. And what we're going to discover as we enter into this part of our discussion is that the divide between Joseph and his brothers will run as a seam, a fault line, through the whole of Jewish history, and it will be a divide that exists to this very day. And if we thought, based upon what we've learned in our sessions until now, that the world is a messy place, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to get a lot messier. 
So let's step back a little bit in this narrative. After the incident of the stolen blessings that we discussed last week, Yitzchak sends Yaakov to Haran to take a wife from the daughters of Lavan. Lavan is Yitzchak's brother-in-law, Rivka's brother, and is a member of the family. Jacob has to flee there because Esau wants to kill him for what he's done to him. And Jacob is now very concerned that it's time for, uh, Yitzchak is very concerned it's time for Jacob to get married. So you always want to marry into the Mishpacha and he sends him to his brother-in-law to Laban to find a wife. Let's listen now in our third piece to what happens when Jacob arrives in Haran. Let me just find this, um, this piece for us and get it up on the screen. Share screen. Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. The eyes of Leah were tender, and Rachel was of beautiful form and beautiful appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Laban said, Better I give her to you than I give her to another man. Stay with me. Jacob worked for Rachel seven years, and they were in his eyes as a few days in his love for her. And Jacob said to Laban, Bring here my wife, as my days are fulfilled, and I will come to her. Laban gathered all the people of the place and made a feast. It was in the evening, and he took his daughter Leah and brought her into him, and he came to her. It was in the morning, and behold, she is Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Have I not served with you for Rachel? Why have you deceived me? And Laban said, It is not so done in our place to give the younger before the firstborn. Laban, however, agrees to allow Jacob to marry Rachel as well, in exchange for another seven years of labor. He came also to Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah, and he worked with him yet another seven years. And that is how Jacob ended up marrying both Leah and Rachel. Leah proceeded to have four children, one right after the other, Reuben, Simon, Levi, and Judah, while Rachel remained childless. Determined to participate in the creation of the people of Israel, Rachel asked Jacob to marry her maidservant, Bilia, and have children with her. That union produced Dan and Naphtali. Not to be outdone, Leah had Jacob marry her maidservant, Zilpah, which produced two more children, Gad and Ashar. Then Leah had another three children of her own, two sons and a daughter, Issachar, Zebulon, and Dina. Finally, Rachel's prayers were answered, and she conceived a child. Joseph was born. Eight years later, Rachel had a second son, but she tragically died in childbirth. The boy was named Benjamin. Okay. So, after reading the story, at face value, at any rate, we can understand Jacob's preferential treatment for Joseph. Joseph was the firstborn of Rachel, the only wife that Jacob wanted in the first place, born to his mother after many, many years of childlessness. In Jacob's eyes, Joseph will always be the true firstborn, 
regardless of the fact that chronologically speaking, Jacob has 10 older sons. And therefore, when Joseph comes to Jacob and reports that his dreams are predicted that he would be a leader, what does the text say? Jacob inwardly guarded the matter, meaning that he hoped for its realization because he wanted his firstborn son to become the leader. And this also explains why Jacob was so fearful for the safety of Benjamin, Rachel's only other child, the one who she died for in giving, giving birth, and why he was so reluctant to allow Benjamin to join his brothers on their trip to Egypt, especially following Rachel's tragic death and, and Joseph's tragic disappearance. So in this very complex family, we can also begin to understand the feelings of jealousy that this evoked in Jacob's other children, particularly the children of Leah, the six children of Leah, the seven children of Leah, including Dina, six brothers and one, and one daughter, and their animosity towards Joseph. After all, Leah was Jacob's first wife, the, mo the mother of the majority of his children, and yet he spurned her, and he persisted in his preference for Rachel's children. And therefore, the seed was planted for a rift between Rachel's firstborn, Joseph, and the children of Leah under the leadership of Yehuda, Judah. So how did this whole messy situation come about? And the answer is, you got it, by a deception. Again. When Jacob wanted to marry Rachel, he was tricked into marrying Leah first. Now, when you look at it, this deception is extraordinarily similar to the one that Jacob himself perpetrated on his brother Asaph. In that instance, Jacob, who was the younger brother, impersonates his older brother. And now he, in turn, is tricked by an older sister, Leah, when she impersonates her younger sister, Rachel. Isn't it perfect? Measure for measure. The Midrash puts it very dramatically. It's your text number nine on page 114. And a reader, please. Anyone, it's fine. Otherwise you'll force me to read and you don't want that to happen. All that night, Jacob was calling to her. Rachel, and she responded in kind. Then, in the morning, she was Leah. Said Jacob to her, Deceiveress, the daughter of Deceiver, was I not calling you Rachel, and you were answering me? Said she to him, Every teacher has his pupils. When your father was calling you, he saw, did you not answer him in the same way? Isn't that great? That's what you call a real shtech. <laughs> That's sticking the knife in and twisting it, isn't it? But the similarities between the two cases are extraordinary. And Lavan, the father, seems to be aware of this parallel as well. Because when Jacob confronts him and says, why have you deceived me? Lavan replies with a really barbed comment. It's your text number 10 on page 115 for someone to read, please. I'll read it. Laban was taunting Jacob by saying to him, it is not so done in our place. Laban was implying in your place, the youngest child is made into the firstborn as you acted when you appropriated Esau's birthright. But in our place, the firstborn's rights won't be taken from the elder sister and given to the younger. So there you are. Lavan, just like his daughter, Rachel, knows how to twist the knife. And years later, in the clip that we saw, Jacob is going to be tricked by his own children when they bring him the blood-soaked coat of Joseph to mislead him into believing that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. They slaughtered a hairy goat and they dipped the coat in blood 
and they sent the striped coat and they brought it to their father. They said, we found this, please recognize it. Is it our, is it your son's coat or not? And here too, the sages see a connection with Jacob's deception of, uh, de deception of his father in the episode of the blessings. Text, 100, text 11 on page 116. I'll read it. Uh, Jacob was correct in acting as he did. Nevertheless, because he presented a hairy goat to deceive his father that he's on his side, he was punished with another hairy goat whose blood his children presented to him. Regarding Jacob, it says, and the skins of the goat kids she dressed upon his hands and upon the smoothness of his neck. Because of this, they dipped Joseph's coat in the blood and presented him the coat to deceive him. It all corresponds one to the other. So, good people, we have so far in our story a whole thread of deceptions. Jacob's deception, deception in stealing the blessings from Esau. Lavan's deception in tricking Jacob into marrying Leah in addition to Rachel. The brothers' deception when they sell, sold Joseph into slavery. And by the way, it all begins with the serpent's deception in the Garden of Eden in tricking Chava, Eve, into eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You might think, therefore, that the whole basis of our holy Torah is based upon a bunch of deceptions and lies. It's extraordinary. And Andrew's question to me last week, why does it all have to be a deception? These three event, events, that's Jacob's deception in stealing the blessings from Esau, Lavan's deception in tricking Jacob into marrying Leah, and the brothers' deception when they sell Joseph into slavery are all connected, and they will create a schism, which from this point onwards, the Kabbalah is going to term the schism between the children of Leah and the children of Rachel. The, um, you see, the parallel between Jacob's deception and stealing the blessings from Esau and Lavan's deception and switching Leah for Rachel is much more than just measure for measure. It's much more than just a question of just desserts, you know, the kind of thing that happens in a story to satisfy the reader, to say, yes, Justice has been done. You know, I feel really good about that now. No, no, something of a much, much deeper nature is going on over here. And we need to try and fathom out and get to the link between these deceptions. Why did the fact that Jacob tricked his father Yitzhak and his brother Esau in order to obtain the blessings of the dew of the heavens and the fat of the land mean that Jacob in turn had to be tricked into marrying Leah. Where's the connection between these two events? Well, the key to all of this are in the two sisters, Leah and Rachel. You remember that last week, we learned that the twin brothers Esau and Yaakov are to be understood as much more than just historical personalities. They are the physical embodiment of two powerful spiritual energies in the creation of the universe. Esau is the embodiment of Tohu. Yaakov is the embodiment of Tikkun. Similarly now, the two sisters are themselves also the embodiment of powerful spiritual energies of two very different kinds. Let's look at the Lubavitcher Rebbe's explanation of the difference between them, and it's in text number 13 on page 118, 118. And a reader, please. Shall I read this one? Why not? Uh, the essential difference between the two groups within the tribes of Israel is that the primary focus of the children of Leah is the service of Teshuvah. And the focus of Rachel's children, Joseph and Benjamin, is the service of Stuckim. Sadakim. 
This has its source in their mothers. Sadikim. 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 Sorry, Sadikim. This yeah. has its source in their mothers. Leah is connected with the service of the masters of return. And Rachel is connected with the service of the perfectly righteous. This is the meaning of the verse. Rachel was of beautiful form and beautiful appearance. Rachel indicates the service of the perfectly righteous, of beautiful form and beautiful appearance without blemish. Regarding Jacob, it is said, Jacob loved Rachel. Because as far as Jacob himself is concerned, his primary task in life is the service of the perfectly righteous. As it says, Jacob was a wholesome man, a dweller of tents. His achievements are in the inside, within the realm of holiness, rather than in, than in venturing out to elevate the outside to holiness. This is the deeper meaning of what the sages relate, that people were saying, Rebecca has two sons and Laban has two daughters. The elder will marry the elder and the younger will marry the younger. Leah's life mission, which is the service of the masters of return, indicates that her task is to turn Esau back Esau to goodness. Not so Rachel, whose mission is the service of the perfectly righteous. Okay, let's uh, unpack some of this over here. So in this piece, the Rebbe draws a distinction between the life mission of the children of Leah, that derives from her mother, and the life mission of the children of Rachel that derives from Rachel. There are two general paths or paradigms in the service of God. That of the tzaddik, that is to say, the righteous person, perfection, the one who has not sinned, and the ba'al teshuva, the master of return, the spiritual power of return or reconnection, because the root of the word teshuva is from the word shuv, which means to turn. So Rachel now is the embodiment of the service of the tzaddik, and the life mission of her children is to express that spiritual quality. That is why she's described in the text as of beautiful form and of beautiful appearance, this sense of spiritual perfection. Leah is the embodiment of the service of return, the avodah of teshuva, and the life mission of her children is to express that spiritual quality. And this is encapsulated in the phrase that the eyes of Leah are rakot, tender or delicate, from crying, as we will discover in a moment. So the tzaddik deals only with holy and spiritual things, steering clear of anything that is evil or coarse or materialistic. Like the original Yaakov, that is to say the Yaakov before he appropriated the material blessings that were designated for Esau. The tzaddik is the dweller of tents, remaining firmly within the spirituality of the tents of learning. And like Rachel, the tzaddik is of beautiful form, beautiful appearance, never compromising the wholesomeness, the perfection of a spiritual life. But the Ba'al Teshuva, the master of return, the one who has to return, is the one who has to venture out into the material, messy world to engage with, the, with its coarseness, with its, the imperfections of materialism, and to become sullied by it and caught up in it. And like the original Esau, that is, the Esau before he becomes corrupted, the Baal Teshuvah is called the man of the field, a cunning hunter, but in a positive sense. This is the person whose life mission is to navigate the treacherous territory of the animal forces within oneself, the animalistic forces within the material world, and to transform that world into a holy and a godly place. Now, if the coming together of a man and a woman in marriage is to create a partnership in which each spouse complements and enhances the other so they can fulfill their spiritual destiny, it would have made perfect sense for Rachel to marry Joseph. 
and for Leah to marry Esau. Because Rachel's soul, like Jacob's, belongs to the world of Tikkun. Leah's soul, with her power of return, has the capacity to help Esau's wild tohu soul find its way back to godliness. And indeed, in a piece of Talmud, to which the Rebbe himself had referred in the passage which you just read, we discover that Leah is indeed destined from the outset to marry not Jacob, but Esau. And I refer you to your text number 12 on page 117. A reader, please. Hey, I heard people talking. Rebecca has two sons and Levon has two daughters. The elder will marry the elder and the younger will marry the younger. She would sit at the crossroads and inquire, how does the elder son conduct himself? He is a wicked man, a highway robber. How does the younger son conduct himself? A wholesome man dwelling in tents. So she wept until her eyelashes fell out. And this is an interpretation of her tender eyes. The eyes which are red and tender from weeping. Weeping because she is destined from the very outset to belong to Aesop, to marry Esau. The older to the older, the younger to the younger. That's the way it's supposed to be. Tikkun to tikkun, Tohu to Tohu. That's destiny. Leah is Esau's soulmate. Rachel is the soulmate of Yaakov. So what went wrong? How did this all get messed up? What went wrong was the same thing that went wrong, so to speak, when with Jacob's deception of Isaac when Rivka intervened. What we discussed last week was that Yitzhak's original reign, role was for parallel roles for, I, for, A, for Esau and Yaakov. Esau transforms the material world. Yaakov pursues spiritual perfection. But Rivka then, remember, understood prophetically that Esau had become corrupted by materialism and the animalistic nature that was supposed to transform the world had become corrupted. And therefore, while Esau's tohu is higher, more powerful than Yaakov's tikkun, only the disciplined spirituality of Yaakov could harness the tremendous potential contained in Esau's world. And therefore, Jacob had to assume a leading role in the material world as well. He had to obtain mastery over the dew of the heavens and the fat of the earth, as we called it so many times, and become the guiding force that sanctifies the material world. And that, by the way, had to be done in answer to Andrew Kemp's question, that could only be accomplished by deception. The original deception by the serpent in the Garden of Eden is what caused in the first place the chaotic, chaotic nature of the material world, the mixing of the sparks of holiness entangled with the sparks of chaos that came about through a deception. A deception occurs when something that should have happened is hijacked. And following that original deception, the world now could only be infiltrated in the story of Jacob and Esau by means of a counter deception. But it's more than that. It required a deception then because Jacob was reluctant to assume the responsibility for a messy material world in which good and bad are inextricably intermixed. Jacob in his nature and himself just wants to be the spiritual Jacob. For his part, Jacob would have been perfectly content with receiving only the blessings of Abraham that his father Yitzchak had always intended to bestow upon him. In his nature, he wanted no part of the 
political and difficult rough and tumble of the Tohu world. It's not only Isaac that was deceived on that occasion. In a sense, we have to understand that Jacob himself was, in inverted commas, deceived by being forced by his mother into taking responsibility for the physical and material world that he didn't want to take responsibility of because it is against his nature. Tikkun doesn't want to have to interact with Tohu. And therefore, even after he has obtained the blessings of the dew of the heaven and the fat of the earth, he still yearns only for the spiritual path of the tzaddik. You can't take it out of the man. That's what he wants. So when it comes time for Jacob to seek a wife, and he discovers that one of the sisters of his cousins is invested with a soul that is just like his, a genuine soul mate. Rachel, of course, he is deeply, deeply attracted to her. There's a deep bond in love, and he's going to choose her as his life's partner because together, Tikkun and Tikkun, it's going to be a symphony of holiness, of righteousness, of order. It's beautiful. But the problem is this. What Rivka has achieved through her deceptive scheme not only can't be undone, it mustn't be undone. Tohu continues to require the restraint of Tikkun. So that first deception therefore has to be followed by a further deception. And this time it is Jacob himself who has to be deceived. He has to be tricked into marrying Leah, the elder sister who is the counterpart of the elder Asaph, embodying the primordial world of Tohu and the task of the Baal Teshuvah, the master of return, who repairs Tohu's broken vessels, retrieves the, the fallen sparks. It's very dramatic. There are forces at play over here that are producing outcomes that you can't argue with. It's destiny. It's the Almighty working his world. And now, as a result of Jacob's marriage to both Rachel and Leah, Tikkun now has two strands. One in which Tikkun is paired with Tikkun, Jacob and Rachel, and the other in which Tikkun is now paired, paired with the Teshuvah dimension of Tohu, Yaakov, and Leah. Once we have grasped this, everything else about this entire story begins to fall into place. Let's return for a moment to our second question. Joseph's curious behavior towards his brothers when they appear before him after he's become viceroy of Egypt. If Joseph indeed harbored no animosity towards them, as seems clearly indicated in the text that we read, what was the purpose of all the trials and tribulations that he put them through before revealing his identity to them? Here in text number 14 on page 120 is Maimonides' famous litmus test of teshuva, of return. Please read it, someone. I'll read it. Thank you. Thank you, Roseanne. Sure. Um, what constitutes full teshuva, repentance? When a person is presented with the same sin they transgress, and has the opportunity to again transgress, yet refrains from doing so, 
For example, a person who engaged in forbidden relations with a woman and is subsequently alone with her and his love for her is just as strong and his physical prowess has not diminished and he is in the same surroundings as he was when he sinned, yet he refrains from transgressing. This is a person who has done a full teshuva. Okay, so the man still got koyach and he finds himself in exactly the same situation and he says, nisht, no, I'm not gonna do it. That's teshuva. So a little bit earlier in our story, Joseph has overheard his brothers expressing remorse for their cruelty towards him. Before he can reconcile with them, he has to bring them to the state of complete repentance, complete teshuva, the kind of teshuva that's just been described by Maimonides. Consider this. When Judah approaches Joseph to plea for Jim Benjamin's release, the brothers were in exactly the same situation that they had been in 22 years previously when they plotted against Joseph. Just think about the circumstances. From the brothers' perspective, they were fully justified in what they did. In their eyes, their mum, Leah, was the true wife of Jacob, in whom the, the mission of Israel, of course, is vested. And yet, their father refused to relinquish his preference for Rachel and for Rachel's children. He doted on Joseph. He seemed to be grooming him as his heir and his successor to the covenant of Abraham to their exclusion. So they rid themselves of Joseph in the hope that this would restore them and their mum to the rightful place in Israel and in their father's affections. Instead, what happens? Jacob refuses to reconcile himself to Joseph's loss. He retreats even further away from them. He transfers his love to Rachel's remaining son, Benjamin. For 22 years, he refuses to allow Benjamin out of his sight for fear that he'll meet, meet the same fate as his brother. And now, 22 years later, the brothers stand in the Egyptian viceroy's palace with Benjamin condemned to slavery in a foreign land. And this time, the brothers don't need to even lift a finger against Benjamin to get rid of him. All they need to do is just allow events to take their course. And then, with the whole progeny of Rachel decisively lost to the house of Israel, their father Jacob will finally have to accept the inevitable and recognize them, the children of Leah, as his true progeny. So they are in exactly the same situation that they were in 22 years ago. And this is a situation that Joseph has put them in. This is their test. This time, however, the brothers refused to abandon Benjamin. And it is Yehuda, Judah, the same Judah who led his brother in the brothers in the decision to cast Joseph into the well, as we heard in that clip. Now he puts his own freedom, even his life on the line, to make good the promise to his father that he would guarantee Benjamin's safety. The brothers have passed the litmus test of Teshuva. They are the sons of Leah. She is the power of Teshuva. So what we have in this little piece of narrative over here of the reconciliation between the children of Leah led by Judah and the children of Yosef and the person of Yosef himself is the reconciliation at last between Tohu and Tikkun. And as prophesied by Rivka by, and repeated in Joseph's dreams, Tohu bows down to Tikkun and is under its mentorship, just like Rivka was told when she had the two children in her womb. 
The relationship now between, in this moment, between Tikkun and Tohu has been brought to a climactic fruition. That's the story as we have it. From this point onwards, there will be two factions in the nation of Israel. There will be the children of Rachel embodying the quest for spiritual perfection, the service of the tzaddik, as described in the words of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And there'll be the children of Leah, embodying the task of engaging with the material world, perfecting it and sanctifying it, the service of teshuva, bringing back the sparks and bringing them back to godliness. And these two factions will continue to resonate throughout the rest of Jewish history in parallel one to the other. At times they will clash, at other times they will join forces, but there will always be a tension between them as prophesied to Rivka. An ongoing competition for supremacy. Each faction acknowledges the need for the other, but each believes that it should be the dominant theme in the overall mission of Israel. And here are some examples of where we see this throughout the history of Israel from this point onwards. Let's look at the leadership of Israel and how it passes from the one faction to the other. The first leader, so to speak, of the fledgling nation that would eventually leave Egypt is, of course, Joseph. And we've seen how the children of Leah, despite their initial resistance, eventually bowed down to his sovereignty as predicted in his dreams. The 12 tribes of Israel then enter the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, who is a descendant of Joseph, the children of Rachel. The first Jewish monarch is King Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, the children of Rachel. And then sovereignty is transferred to the tribe of Judah, the children of Leah, with the crowning of King David as the king of Israel. And from that point onwards, the house of David was established as a source for all subsequent leaders of the nation in fulfillment of Jacob's blessing on his deathbed, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the Lord give a staff from be between his feet. The children of Leah now take over. And by the way, this transfer of leadership is not smooth. King Saul fought it for many years in those dramatic passages in the Bible. And three generations, only three generations after, after the house of Judah, the house of children of Leah have taken control under King David and then Solomon, his successor. And under Solomon's son, Yeravim ben Nevat of the tribe of Joseph takes 10 tribes away into rival kingdom of Israel. And there's a split between the children of Rachel in the nation called Judah and the children of Leah in the new nation, which is now called Israel, the northern nation. A split which persists throughout the rest of the history until the 10 tribes disappear. By the way, it is really significant that the mutiny against the house, against the house of Rachel the um, Judah takes place in a town called Shechem, the very same place where the brothers, the sons of Leah, sold Joseph into slavery. And it will take now many centuries before the leadership of Judah will ultimately be restored. That's one example of these, the house of, house of Rachel, the children of Rachel, the children of Leah. 
Example number two. In the course of history, there are two divine dwelling places. The first is the Mishkan, the temporary tabernacle, which was constructed by the children of Israel in the Sinai Desert, and which continued to serve as a central house for worship for over 200 years after they entered the land of Israel before the temple was built. And the second divine dwellings, of course, the temple built by, built by King Solomon, and later in the second temple by Ezra in exactly the same spot when the people returned from the exile in Babylon. These two divine dwellings are in the, each in their own way, the same expression of these two primary elements amongst the tribes of Israel, the children of Rachel and the children of Leah. The Mishkan, the temporary dwelling, stood in a place called Shiloh for over 200 years in the territory of Joseph. And as you'll see in figure 4.2 on page 120, uh, 122, just take a quick look at that diagram and that little writing. It's constructed of a variety of materials which are arranged in ascending order from inanimate materials at the bottom to higher organic materials on the top, representing a life orientated towards growth, spiritual growth, self-improvement, because this is in the territory of Shiloh. These are the children of Rachel, the tribe and the leadership of Joseph. The temple is built in the territory of Judah, and it is made entirely of inanimate matter, stone and mortar, symbolizing the commitment to physical action. We have a tradition about two Mashiachs, which we won't go into in any detail for tonight. One is called Mashiach ben Yosef, and the other one is called Mashiach ben David, the children of Rachel, the children of Judah, uh, children of Leah. You have what you can look at again a little bit later on page 121. You'll see in figure 4.1 a summary of the pathway of these two kingdoms throughout history, of which I've simply given you a couple of examples now. But all of this brings us to the present to tie it together, and more importantly, to ourselves. If Rachel is the paradigm of spiritual growth and Leah is the paradigm of interacting with the physical world to bring it to perfection, which one takes precedence? Which one is more important? Any thoughts? Well, this question was a subject of a discussion which took place many, many years ago in the upper story of a house in Lud in Israel, as told by the Talmud in your reference text number 16 on page 124. It's short. An easy read, no big words, nothing more than two syllables. Okay, I'll read it. Oh, want to read her? Okay, somebody. Okay, I right. want to read her. Um, it was already the case that Rabbi Tarfon and the sages were assembled in the loft of the Nitzah house in Lod, when the query came before them, which is greater, learning or action? Said Rabbi Tarfon, action is greater. Said Rabbi Akiva, learning is greater. Concluded all, learning is greater because learning brings to action. So I'd like to reframe this um, little piece of Talmud 
uh, and phrase it in, in a different way. I'll ask this question now, which is more important, spiritual or religious objectives, which would include things like developing a deeper relationship with God through prayer, Torah learning, performing mitzvot, weeding out negative character traits like selfishness or anger or laziness or greed, nurturing a harmonious home environment and a family life, bringing up your kids so they become stable human beings who can manage relationships and who are at ease with themselves and whole, whole in, their, in their identities, preserving Jewish traditions and values through holiday and through rich holidays and ritual observances, et cetera, et cetera. That will define as spiritual or religious objectives or is it improving our world, fighting for justice, overcoming ignorance, poverty, illness, working for world peace, all those things which today we very conveniently describe under the heading tikkun olam, making the world a better place. This question in the Talmud about which one is greater, learning or action, can be reframed as which is more important, spiritual or religious objectives, which of course is the idea of learning, or improving the world, which is the idea of action. Do you hear in these questions over here that we've just uh, articulated an echo of Joseph and Judah? Jo Joseph Tikkun, spiritual, and Judah, tohu, fixing tohu, layer, working with the physical world, tikkun olam. Here we have the nub of the issue. Here we have the whole issue of the deception of Jacob and Esau and the deception of Rachel and Leah all flowing through in these two paradigm cases of what they represent, coming down, distilling into this fundamental issue. We know that we have these two pathways, the children of Leah, the children of Rachel. We know that they, they both find their way down, work their way through leadership in Israel, through the expression of the hot places in which we worship and in other places as well. And now all of a sudden becomes a very real question for us when you've distilled it down to its bottom line, which is going to be more important for us in Judaism, which is the bigger task, which is the priority. And by the way, this is not a, some kind of theoretical question because in many respects, the Jewish world has made decisions about this. I'm putting it, of course, in very, very general terms and shoot me down, but by and large, the fundamental difference between Orthodox Judaism and Reform Judaism is that Orthodoxy opted for spiritual growth, prayer, mitzvot, and Reform opted for tikkun olam. Look at the programs which are run by reformed communities in this country, and particularly in America, it's all about fixing the world. It's tikkun olam, it's not about me and my own spiritual growth. And each one is at fault because the world has come to see this as a binary choice. It's gonna be one or the other. As if you're an Orthodox Jew, you don't engage in tikkun olam. And if, if, if you are a reformed Jew, you don't engage in the issues of spiritual growth through Torah, mitzvot, etc. But the sages of the Talmud never understood this as a binary choice. They saw that Yosef and his brothers teach us, the whole story teaches us, that these re their respective missions are intertwined. They said, learning leads to action. Yosef is the path 
Yehuda is the goal. Our goal is the perfection of the physical world. But when the sages said that learning is greater because it leads to action, they said that the only way you could get to that level of fixing the world, tikkun olam and way in which it needs to be done, is when you have arrived there through nurturing and developing our internal religious and spiritual lives. That is the conclusion of that little piece of Talmud that we learned when we dig down into it and we unpack it. And therefore the sages and Lord unanimously concluded, learning is greater because learning brings to action. So in conclusion, we have the idea that the sons of Rachel, Joseph, are a pathway to the sons of Leah, Yehuda. And that is the reason why the first leadership are all the descendants of Rachel. Before the sept of kingship passes to the descendants of Leah, King David and his descendants. It is the reason also why as on page 123 in text number 15, the Geri Rebbe, Rabbi Yitzhak Meyav Ger, points out that in these two concepts of the two Mashiachs, the son of the Mashiach ben Joseph and the Mashiach ben David, that Mashiach ben Yosef comes first, preparing the way for Mashiach ben David to bring about the complete redemption. And he says, Joseph doesn't complete the redemption. Judah completes the re redemption because Joseph is only the pathway to Judah. Jo jo Joseph representing spiritual perfection is only there so that it can impact positively upon the world. I have one more little piece to, to add for tonight. In that same passage on page 123, the Gerarebbe also points out very poignantly that it is Leah who was ultimately buried alongside Jacob in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. The wife that he didn't love. Because the destiny of the sons of Rachel, Joseph and all that he spiritually represents, is only to prepare the way towards the ultimate destination. So as a consequence, Rachel herself is buried on the way by the roadside when she dies after having given birth to Benjamin. So the Bible tells us that Jacob and Rachel, one of the greatest love stories in the Bible, Tikkun and Tikkun coming together, symbolizing the unification of the forces of Tikkun, are not buried together and they will not lie alongside each other for eternity. Because for all the great virtues of Tikkun, it is only a pathway to the final destination, which is its mission to be able to act on Tohu. It is a heck of a story. Which next week will lead us to our next important contribution in this extraordinary build up, conceptual build up of the forces at play in the world. <laughs>